Of all the human emotions, love is the most powerful and one for which we are the most powerless. Destructive and blind, it rears its ugly head at a moment's notice and changes perception without credence to prior direction. With it comes change, brutal change, and the unending fear that this fulfilling emotion will soon dwindle away. Some may try to prepare themselves for this moment, but in truth, the best course of action is to respect futility, fall into the dream, and never look back. Portrait of a Lady on Fire was a film I actively avoided out of fear. I may not have been able to admit this to myself, but the potential of re-experiencing heartbreak through the lens of brilliant filmmaking limited my drive to see the film. I might love cinema, but the prospect of isolating myself in a theater of darkness for a couple hours of crying didn't seem too appealing. Take this as a compliment to the filmmaking, as I was confident in the director's ability to express the complexities of love and hardships of loss to be incredibly scared. It should be a surprise then that I didn't feel broken during this film. Rather, the impressive acting and strong screenplay pull you deep into the fantasy. Rather than relying on the audience's personal experience to create emotional tension, the film focuses heavily on the realistic relationship between painter Marianne and Mistress Heloise, a young girl soon to be married to a rather unimpressive nobleman. Marianne is tasked with painting a portrait for Heloise's suitor, but finds herself lost in the deep intricacies of her model. Every brushstroke has an individual sensuality to it, and every aspect of Heloise is defined in the art itself. For a romantic backdrop, painting a detailed, intricate portrait allows for intensely personal hyperfixation on the minutia of her being. The story is as old as time. Two star-crossed lovers faced with a looming deadline explode in a passionate celebration of youthful love while accepting the impending conclusion to what could have been a lifelong treasure. In the execution, however, where Celine Tiama expresses emotions more complex than the average love story. Instead of diving deep into the riches of pretentious direction styles, the film is heavily restrained on all aspects besides acting. The camera work makes certain to always focus on the actors, the setting is limited in color unless it can express some subtle emotion between the leads, and the film only features two pieces of music in its entirety. Both are heard in-universe, and every other scene is shrouded in the blanket of silence. Any distraction from the blossoming relationship has no place in this story. What could have limited the film's emotion only immerses the audience deeper. Shots focus on heavy breathing, trailing sight lines, longing eyes, passionate moments of physical entanglement that break just as honesty begins to flourish. The slow courtship of love is expressed by the subtle stalemate every comet creates. The tension rises, but neither party can fully admit to the burning fire within. It's in the subtle vagueness of the lover's actions that the audience loses the perception of an omniscient third party. Where most films create tension by allowing the audience to know facts unknown by the leads, Siyama creates a situation where the tension of love is ambiguous. There's no explicit knowledge known by any party of the other's emotions, and every action feels like a risk worth taking. Should you have no prior knowledge of the film's narrative direction, the acting leaves both an impression of ambiguity and fear. Just like in reality, it's not absolutely clear that love festers within, and a deep risk of opening oneself to rejection is preserved wonderfully. The few times the film explores music as a language of love feel not only special out of scarcity, but in respect to the keen choice of melody as a vessel for emotion. Not only can it bring back memories of the first listen, but it can also heighten the perception of the surrounding world. Motifs that persist throughout the film often carry this overarching theme of memory as both a tool of appreciation and a last-ditch effort to relive what once was. The tale of Orpheus and Eurydice, which is referenced heavily both explicitly and subtly throughout the film, acts as a thesis statement on looking back out of appreciation while losing what once was. Pictures may hold a visage forever, but soon the person displayed becomes little more than a brushstroke and some paint. They're no longer your lover but a representation of something far away. Despite the heavy subject matter and objectively depressing conclusion, I can't say that this film was outright sad. If anything, the audience becomes enthralled as this love develops, and the looming threat of loss fades deep into the background. Rather than ham-fistedly have the main characters live carefree as the plot heavily reminds the audience of the deadline, the direction allows those watching to blissfully throw caution to the wind as they fall deep into the fantasy. One scene I loved in particular came right before the impending separation. Instead of using this moment to create conflict as a manner of reinforcing the emotional pain to come, Marianne and Heloise simply stare into each other's eyes as they relive what they knew to be special. That scene in particular furthers the individuality of the direction. These leads aren't forced into a pressured relationship, nor one with strong conflict, but one with a definite time of death. This distinction may not seem all that impressive, but it allows the characters to develop as a normal relationship would and experience heartbreak more universal than a niche, esoteric, cinematic breakup. There isn't a strong sense of melodrama keeping the situation from feeling real, and this makes the conclusion more palatable in a sense. 
Now, comparisons to Call Me By Your Name are a given here, and I heard many people leaving the theater express that exact sentiment. They're right. In a basic way, the two movies are very similar. They both follow a relationship form out of passion, develop in secret, and find themselves concluding just as the love is at its peak. However, the filmmaking style and direction with both pieces couldn't be more different. Where Guadagnino implemented heavy musical narration and a unique camera work to create a feeling of love, Tsuyama focuses truly on writing the most realistic relationship brought to film. Call Me By Your Name creates a feeling that reminds audience of a time where their heart was broken. But Portrait of a Lady on Fire immerses the audience in something beautiful, allowing them to feel like a part of the deeply personal experience without having to endure the heartbreak yet again. Call Me By Your Name recreates emotions. Portrait of a Lady on Fire recreates situation. I'm reminded of heartbreak as I watch Elio stare into the fireplace, but I'm quickly losing control of my breath as Marianne breaks the tension and embraces Heloise for the first time. To my left were a group of teens who seemed to come straight out of an indie film, thin-rimmed glasses and all. To my right was the scent of another patron's deep red wine, often wafting past my nose during the most romantic of scenes. Unlike my initial fears, I was in the mood for immersion and love, curious to follow these characters down the path of unmarked territory. The slow build of the two leads trading flirtations had me on the edge of my seat, and the climactic moment where passion boils over and explodes in a fiery display brought me strong catharsis. The slow build of the two leads trading flirtations had me on the edge of my seat, and the climactic moment where passion boils over and explodes in a fiery display brought me strong catharsis. It's in the final shot that the film truly realizes what it aimed to describe. The greatest success in the film is that it sets out to do very little, and does so with an unmatched sense of perfection. Tsuyama tells a brilliant love story not by exploring every possibility romance brings, but by recognizing that true immersion is guaranteed by exercising strong restraint. Absolutely everything the film sets out to do is completed perfectly. As the final scene begins, what amounts to little more than tears and music concludes the film on one of the highest notes in film history. Restraint, passion, and femininity. All of these brilliant themes and more come together to make Portrait of a Lady on Fire one of the best films I've seen in a long time. Viewers may be put off by the film's slow, methodical burn, but the satisfying conclusion and acute sense of emotional payoff leaves the audience devoid of boredom. Superb performances by Naomi Merlan and Adele Hanel, among the rest of the cast, immerse the audience into this world, and a brilliant script by Siyama exposes realism through fantasy. Portrait of a Lady on Fire is a modern masterpiece, and one of the few films that can truly be called beautiful. 9 out of 10.